Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Second. Man, we're so glad you chose to come and worship with us. And just to clarify that, if you think uh, at all that Cane's is better than Chick-fil-A, I need to introduce you to my Jesus at the end of the service. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we're so glad you're with us. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, will you open them with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 is, is where we're going to be studying Today and as you're turning there, uh, in, in 1900 or in the 1900s, there was a pastor in Texas by the name of J. Frank Norris. J. Frank Norris was the first megachurch pastor in Texas, but he was also arguably the first megachurch pastor in America. And he, he was he was a famous guy, though he was not necessarily someone that we would all uh, want to emulate because Norris was a lightning rod for controversy. Uh, he was one of those pastors that if he disagreed with you, whether you were a political figure or maybe of another faith or something like that, uh, his next sermon would be about you. He was one of those guys, okay? So, so that, that's kind of who he was. Uh, and, and he had all sorts of different controversies that happened. He was suspected of arson at two of his churches, misappropriating funds at a Bible college he ran, but, but arguably uh, his greatest claim to fame or infamy uh, happened in his office on July the 7th, 19, or 17th, 1926. Uh, leading up to that day, Norris had made a bunch of comments about the then mayor of Fort Worth. You see, Norris pastored in Fort Worth, and he said all kinds of things, bashing this guy. He just didn't like him because he was Catholic. And he went as far as to say that this mayor wasn't even fit to be a mayor of a hog pen. If that's not a Texas put down, I don't know what is, right? He said, he said that, and so, so one, of, one of the mayor's constituents... Uh, took issue with that and came to meet Norris at his office and, and he came to the church and went to this, this pastor's office and they started exchanging words and it got loud and Pastor Norris pulled out a revolver and shot him dead in his office. Can you believe that? A pastor. And as, 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 I, was, as, as I was thinking about that story, it, it reminded me of, of this proverb in, in Proverbs chapter 29 Verse 11 that says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds back. Now, I hope that, that no one in this room has been a part of any sort of conflict in the last week or month or year or ever that, that has led to physical violence. But, but if I had to guess, if I were a betting man, I would bet that every single person in here had some form of conflict this last week. If I had to bet, I'd bet that. But, but to take that a step further, I would, I would also argue, I, I would guess that everybody in here has had some form of a major conflict in the last month or so. And by major conflict, I mean something like a little bit more than uh, you ask for no onions on your burger and they put onions on your burger. Okay, like serious conflict, whether, whether that's with your coworker or your spouse or your kids or someone you go to school with or, or whatever it is, you have had conflict. And the reason why I know that you've had conflict is because I have also had conflict. Well, what's incredible about conflict is, and I think uh, spouses in the room can attest to this, sometimes really big conflict can start out with a really small infraction, right? Married couples in here, have you ever gotten to like a massive fight and then at the very end of the fight, hopefully you make up and then you say, what were we even fighting about? Like, what even started that thing? I don't even know what, what, what started that deal. Here's the deal. Here's what I know about you, regardless of, of what church you go to, regardless of your race or your ethnicity, regardless of your heart language, your socioeconomic status, whether you work a blue-collar job or a white-collar job or a student. One thing I know about you is this. You have conflict. And the reason why I know you have conflict is because you're a person. <laughs> and, and, and people have conflict. In fact, there, there's this old pastor saying that, man, ministry would be a whole lot of fun if it weren't for all the people. <laughs> but, but for the leaders in the room, the, those that manage people, maybe you're in HR, maybe even if you lead one or two people, you know this, that the old adage, more money, more problems, is also true of people, right? More people more problems. And so, so, so here's, here's the question that I want to pose to you today to kick off the series. It's this. 
what is the source of our conflict? What is the source of our conflict? If, if all of us have conflict, and fairly regularly have conflict, what is it? Is, is there some sort of source that's driving our conflict? The, the married couples in the room are like pointing at their spouses right now. Stop it. <laughs> no. But, but what is the source of your conflict? I, I mean, I mean, be going well beyond the, the Cheetos on the floor or the dirty clothes not in the hamper or your kids not cleaning their rooms, all those things. What is the deeper reason that we have conflict and have it regularly? Thankfully, conflict is not new to the 21st century. In fact, it's, it's not new to the modern era. The, the modern era. We had conflict in the 20th century, the 19th century, the 18th century. We've always had conflict. We, we've had conflict as long as we've recorded history. And so James actually writes really specifically to conflict in James chapter 4. That's what we're going to be reading today in James chapter 4, starting in verse 1. If you have your Bibles, uh, please follow along with me in your Bibles. If not, you can follow with me on the screens. James writes these words. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. See, James, James starts off here, and, and he's given us a pretty difficult message. J James begins by asking, hey, why do you have quarrels? Why do you have fights? Why do you have conflict among you? And everybody else would want to answer James, though he's kind of speaking rhetorically here or writing rhetorically. We'd want to respond to James and say, oh, I'll tell you why I have conflict. I have conflict because they said this. Or I have conflict because they did that. Or I have conflict because last week at Easter when the family was over, they didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, but they hinted. And I know what that hinting meant. I know what they were saying. And that's why I have conflict. And we would say this and that and them and those and all these things. But what James would want to say to the Christian is, whoa, 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 whoa. Slow the blaming roll, okay? Maybe the reason that you have conflict isn't everyone else's fault. It's kind of like the old, uh, the old thing you used to say whenever you were in junior high and high school and you wanted to break up with somebody, right? It's not you, it's me, right? What you really meant by that is, it's not me, you're crazy, right? <laughs> That's what you meant, but, but you said this. You said, it's, it's not you, it's me. What, what, what James is pointing the Christian to here in this text, he's saying, hey, maybe it's not them, maybe it's you. And this is kind of the, the beginning place of this series that we're in right now that we're entitling, I'm Right, you're wrong. I, ho I hope you see at this point that this is kind of a play on words. So the, the spouses, do not go home and say, well, the pastor taught on this. It said it on the screen, so I'm right and you're wrong. That's not what this is about. This is a sarcastic play on words, okay? But what, what we're trying to show is that even though lots of times we feel as though we are right and the person that we're at conflict with is wrong, the truth isn't always centered in that same position, even though that it's maybe it's the other person's behavior that initiated the conflict, ultimately what, what, I, what I've seen is unless you or they are just punching each other in the face, it takes two to fight. It takes two to have conflict. And what, what, what James is pointing out here is what Paul Tripp, the modern theologian, points out. You want to know why we have conflict? We have conflict because we are sinners trying to relate with sinners in a broken world. You see, what, what, what we would see in Scripture and what, what James points out here and what he's going to continue to point out over and over and over again in this passage is that the reason why we have conflict is this nasty little three-little word called sin. 
You see, there, there was a time, uh, it wasn't a very long time, but there was a time in humanity where there was no conflict, even among members of the opposite sex. Can you believe that? No conflict at all. They absolutely got along perfectly, and it was, it was before the fall of Adam and Eve, right? Before the fall, before they ate the fruit, and the husbands in here are like elbowing their wives, like it's their fault. It's not their fault, husbands. We ate it too, okay? We, we both ate it. But, but see, it before the fall, everything was in perfection. However, when we chose to eat the fruit, what we chose was we chose that we wanted to go our way instead of God's way. And we made that decision to go our way instead of God's way. What happened was our relationship with God was forever fractured in such a way that we would never be able to relate with God the same way again unless he did something about it. But not just that. Not only was our relationship with God fractured, also the way we related with one another was broken. Because now we had these selfish desires within us. Now... We wanted what we wanted, regardless of what someone else wanted. See it. Why is marriage so difficult, even though we pretend in the church that marriage isn't difficult? You want to know why? It's because of sin. You want to know why raising kids is so difficult? It's not because your kids are hellions and everyone else's is great. Okay, that's not it. It might be it, but no, it's not it. It's because sin is in the world. Sin wreaks havoc in all of our earthly relationships. However, this is also the reason why a week ago we celebrated, those of us that are Christians, celebrated Easter, right? Because in the celebration of Easter, what we celebrated was that God made a way when there was no way for us to relate with him again. And that way was through a man named Jesus. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life that we could never live. He died the death that we deserved on the cross. And then three days later, he rose again. That's what Easter is celebrating is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of Christ's resurrection, we can now relate with God. God has made us sons and daughters of himself in his kingdom. Hear it. If you are in Christ, you aren't the way you used to be. You're now who God designed you to be. But not just that. That's amazing news. It's amazing that God would reconcile us to himself, that he would give us a righteousness that isn't ours. But not only did God do that, God also paved a way for Christians to relate rightly again with one another. God made a way for us to relate rightly correctly with one another. But James continues to show us here that we continue to have these fights. Read with me here, and we're going to start in verse 2 and continue forward. James says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have, see this, because you do not ask. You ask And do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is no purpose that the scriptures say he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? See, see what James is saying here? I mean, again, this is, this is a really hard passage. James is not like sugarcoating this or, or giving you a feel-good message today. James is, James is kind of confronting you and coming out swinging. And he's saying, hey, some of the reasons why you have conflict isn't them, it's you. But not just you, it's these desires that, that, that wage within you. The, these desires to have and you can't have and so you covet and you take and you do all of these different things. But, but the big thing, and this is kind of curious, if you look in your Bibles with me in verse uh, 3, what's, what's ironic is in the middle of this passage, there's this like little like plug for prayer. Did you see that? In the very middle of this thing is he's talking about having conflict with one another and how we are to relate with one another. James says this, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. Isn't that strange? You see, what, what, what he's talking about here is, he, lots of times we, we read this scripture and we put it in the realm of things. 
Like, you do not have because you don't, do not ask. So ask away and you'll get it. So if you ask for a Lamborghini, you'll get a Lamborghini. If you ask for this, you'll get that. You'll get that. But, but be careful here. That's not what James is saying here. Remember, James is speaking in the context of relationship, but also to guard the believer from thinking, if you ask, you'll get whatever in the world you want, like God's some sort of cosmic fairy that's just wanting to wave his wand over your life. Instead, what, what he tells us here is, some of the times, the reason why you ask and you don't receive is because your motives are off. You ask for selfish purposes. But see it. See, see what James is saying here. He, he brings up all the quarreling. He tells us the reason. And he also, in that same kind of vein, gives us a solution to some of our conflict problems. See, what, what James is suggesting here is that oftentimes, and I, I've seen this at work in my life, I don't know about you, but we'll have conflict with someone else and we'll try to figure it out, right? We'll do whatever we can to figure it out. How many of you have been driving down the road and you drove 30 minutes to work and the entire 30-minute drive, you were playing out a conversation in your head and how it was going to go, well, I'm going to say this and then they're going to say that and then I'm going to get them with that one, right? You're thinking these things. And you play this out and you think, this is what I'm going to do. This is how it's going to work out. And we, we, we plan and we try and we scheme. Or, or maybe you've been a part of conflict before where maybe somebody wronged you and then they, they made you cookies as though cookies are going to make you feel better. And you're like, I'll eat them, but I'm still mad at you. <laughs> Thank you for the cookies. And we, we think, oh, well, if I just get them this, that will make this better. Or if I just do that, guys buying flowers to make this better. Or if I just do this over here, that will make that better. Or these things will make this over here better. But, but what, what James is saying here is, Christian, the solution to your relational problems aren't found on this earth. The solution to your relational problems is seeking your Father in heaven first. This is weird. This is kind of countercultural. But, but, but what, what James is going to say here, he's, gonna, he's about to emphasize it again, is until we seek the face of God, we might not rightly seek reconciliation like we ought. Until, until we seek God like we are called to seek God, we might not see the, our fellow man like we ought to. Why? Because oftentimes we yearn for happiness instead of holiness. Right? Lots of times we desire riches more than righteousness. We want, we want to win right now instead of looking at what it looks like to win in eternity. But, but what's great is James doesn't leave us here. He kind of gives us a, a solution as, as he finishes out this section. He continues on in verse 6. <clears throat> and he says this. He says, but he, meaning God, gives more grace Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and let your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will exalt you. This is a beautiful, hope-filled passage, not only for the one in the middle of conflict today, but also for the Christian that's like me and struggles with sin from time to time. Because James gives us a step-by-step way to have victory in our relationships and in life in general. Look back at your Bibles. He says in verse 6, he says, what do you do first? You look to the grace of God. You look to God's grace. You want to know how, how in the world do we, do we figure out conflict management? The very first thing you do is you come to a gracious God that's given grace to you. You seek his grace. And when you come to realize the grace that God has bestowed upon you, even though you are a sinner not deserving it, it allows you to kind of reorient and possibly extend grace on someone that doesn't deserve it. Let me say that again. If whenever you recognize the grace that God has given to you, it will enable you, will give you the ability to be able to extend grace to someone that not only doesn't deserve it, but possibly hasn't even asked for it yet. Maybe, maybe they are still obstinate. Maybe they are still in the wrong with you, but see it, even though they're in the wrong with you, you can be in the right with them. 
Why? Because God has bestowed grace upon you. So you can be right with him. But he he goes on, verse 7, he says, submit yourself to God. Continue on in verse 7, he says, resist the devil. Even when you have those negative, evil, awful thoughts that, man, if I see them in the back alley, I'm putting on a mask and beating them up. No. (laughs) Resist that. Resist that. Verse 8, draw near to God. Also in verse 8, purify your heart. And then I don't want you to miss this. In verse 10, he says, be humble. Did you notice that, that, that James, in, in, these, in these verses, in verses 6 through 10, James bookends both of these with the concept of humility. See, James reminds us that the very first step that a Christian takes toward Christ is a step in humility. It's a step in saying, God, you're right, I'm wrong. I want to go your way, not my way. I've tried going my way, my way's not right, I want to go your way. That's a step in humility. But Christians, this is where we get it wrong. Oftentimes we think, well, I've taken that step, but see it, Christian, every other step of the Christian life is also a step in humility. Every other step is also saying, God, you're right, I'm wrong. I want to do what you would have me do right now in this moment. God, you're right, I'm wrong. I want to do as you would have me do in this relationship right here. See, I'm I'm becoming more and more convinced that the key to stewarding conflict for the Christian is humility. It's figuring out how to be humble, how to humbly Submit yourself before God, but also humbly submit yourself before your fellow man, even when they're wrong. Even when they're wrong. So I was thinking about this this last week. I was thinking about um, uh, whenever we were first married, I, I, remember, uh, I remember asking different uh, Christian couples like, uh, just about conflict. You know? And I, I would ask them, hey, when was the last time you had a really good fight? And, and I had Christian couples tell me, oh, we don't ever fight. And so for the longest time, I was thinking, man, I am messed up. Like, I, you guys might not, I do all that. We do. You know, I don't know what's going on here. But what I, what I learned was that was just Christianese for I don't feel comfortable talking about this right now. <laughs> Be, because all married couples have conflict. But not just that, all people have conflict, as we've talked about so far. And as I was thinking about this last week, as I've counseled folks and couples and, and business leaders and things like that, lots of times we have natural dispositions that we take whenever we have conflict. Every, everyone has a natural disposition. There are a bunch of them. I, as I was thinking this last week, I identified three, and I, I wonder if any of these fit any of you in here. The, the very first disposition that, that I identified that's kind of a natural disposition is that of the bulldozer. Anybody ever known a bulldozer, right? This, this is the one that says, I'm right, you're wrong, get over it. My way or the highway, there's the door, right? The, the, there's no reasoning, there's no rationality, there's no, it's, this is how it is. All right, quit staring at them, <laughs> stop it. All right, and, we, and we, we like to give bulldozers a hard time, but, but they're not the only one. A, a second disposition that, that, I think that many of us maybe fall into is that of the volcano, <laughs> right? It's where this is where you have an issue, but you pretend like you don't. <laughs> no, we're good, and you just stuff it down, right? And then, and then, and then something else comes. Oh no, we're good. God bless you. We're I, Jesus loves you, and so do I, right? That kind of thing. And you stuff it and stuff it and stuff, and then all of a sudden, volcano, right? It just explodes, and and your spouse and your kids and your coworkers are like. What is going on right now? You know what? What is that? The volcano. That's what it is. The third one is the avoider. Right? I'm pretending like I don't have conflict. If I I just pretend like it's not there, it's going to go away. Lots of times the avoider had a really annoying younger sibling growing up, and they, they lived this, that if they just ignored them, they'd go away. And they think that conflict will be the same way. But as adults, what we find out is when you avoid conflict, oftentimes it snowballs. (laughs) It becomes worse and worse and worse. And I know we're laughing at all three of these, and the reason why we're laughing at all three of them is because we identify as all three of them. I had someone come up to me at the last service, and they're like, what if you're all three? (laughs) God bless your spouse, right? That's what I said. Oh, man, but, but we, we identify as all three of these different things in different ways. But here's what I'd like to posit before you. 
What I'd like to share is the key for the Christian is not necessarily dismantling your disposition, but rather in humility embracing who God made you to be. So, for example, like, like a really easy way to do this is we think that, you know what, uh, I, the bulldozer's always wrong. They're just plowing people. Can you believe the way that he handled himself? Can you believe he plowed someone over? Like, I would never do that. You know, that kind of, and we like to just kind of throw stones at, at, at that person. But in actuality, what if, what if a bulldozer maybe instead of just, I'm right, you're wrong, that's it, period, took time to listen and hear see you see lots of we we like to bash the bulldozers but the truth is if you're ever in a construction project you need a bulldozer every once in a while god designed them that way and it can be redeemed the same is true for the volcano right the volcano has the ability oftentimes to feel in ways that other dispositions don't it's a beautiful thing and but but hear it it takes humility to if if you fall in that category it takes humility to say hey I told you that this was okay, and it's not. This really hurts me. This is really difficult for me. Or, or, or the, the avoider. Lots of times we think that people are avoiding conflict because, because they're a coward or they're afraid. But, but the truth is, lots of times someone's avoiding conflict because they love you. And they can't imagine the world without you. They, they, they don't want to they don't want to do things to mess up your relationship and so they'll avoid they'll avoid they'll avoid but you know what's so beautiful is when in humility the avoider is able to come to terms with that and say you know what I've been avoiding this and I'm sorry what they'll find is they'll find a love that doesn't reject them when they walk through conflict it's a beautiful thing but see it all of these all three of them the key to redeeming this disposition, to being who God made you to be, is one word, humility. Humility, humbling yourself. What is the source of our conflict? Can I tell you what the source is? It's not them, it's you. <laughs> it's you. I wanna, I wanna finish with, a, I wanna close with one more story. Um, it's actually from my week this last week. Some of you know this, some of you don't know this. Uh, but I'm coaching T-ball right now. And uh, I don't know what hell's like, but it might involve coaching T-ball. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, but, but I'm coaching T-ball, and we're having a good time doing that. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you. This last week, we had a T-ball game. And your sanctified pastor got fired up at the T-ball game. <laughs> it was competitive. We had some conflict with the other team. And I was ticked off. <laughs> and uh, I had one of my assistant coach is actually a church member here. He's one of my great friends, one of my accountability partners. And, and in between innings, I had to go up to him and say, I am so angry right now. I need your help. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and said, hey, just remember, we're just here to help our kids have fun. Let them do what they're going to do. Our kids are just going to have fun. And I needed to hear that. I need to hear, yeah, you're right. They are just going to have fun. And they did have fun running to third base and they're supposed to run to first and, you know, all that stuff. They had fun doing all that. But, but see it. I was wrong. And I needed to, in humility, say, I need your help. I need your help. But also my friend, in kind of another form of humility, had to be willing to be honest me in that. So what about you? As we're diving into this series, what we want to teach is we want to teach a healthier way to handle conflict. But I believe this, that the very first step in handling conflict well is realizing that sometimes we have a role to play in conflict. So, so here's what I want to do. Um, the team's going to come out here. They're going to play. I want to ask if you'd stand with us. We're going to close in worship, but I want to pray for us. Let's pray. Father God, we want to say together that we love you. God, we want to be a people that are humble. God, we want to be a people that, God, just embrace the way you made us. God, for the leaders in here, they're going to have to manage conflict tomorrow. God, would you, would you help them to do that in humility? God, for the couples in here that are at odds with one another, God, would you help them 
to reconcile in humility. God, for the parent in here that's struggling in parenting with their kid, God, would you help them to embrace their kid and to approach them in humility and in so doing, God, teach them how Christians handle conflict. God, would you help us be more like your son, Jesus? And we pray that in his name. And everyone said?